Good morning. I'm Peter Martinson. It's August 20th, 2011, and you're watching the LaRouche Pack Weather Report. Now we're going to get right into the meaty material of this show. If you've been watching uh, the LaRouche Pack website over the past couple of weeks, you should have recognized that we've been asserting, along with all the great thinkers of the past, that the universe is not a dead universe. It is creative inherently. In fact, the substance of the universe is mind. And we know this by looking at how a human mind discovers a principle and how society then uses that discovery to increase mankind's power over the universe. The universe presents itself to us in the form of sense perceptions like vision, sound, or if you live up on Capitol Hill, you get a good sense of smell. But the universe presents itself to us like this. We construct new sense perceptions in the form of scientific instruments like telescopes and things like that in order to reveal more of the universe. But we understand that each of those sense perceptions is only presenting a cross-section of the universe. If you took all of the sense perceptions and assembled them all into one big lump, you would not get the real universe. A human takes a few of those sense perceptions, combines them, and compares how the universe presents itself differently in different sense perceptions, and then he uses his imagination to discover what unsensible principle has to be generating those paradoxes between the senses. Hence, the substance of the universe is represented by the discovery, not by the sense perceptions generated by the universe's principles. Hence, the universe is composed of the creative mind. Now, the goal of man is not to try to gather all the sense perceptions, although we do naturally, as a human instinct, thirst for an ever-increasing menu of sense perceptions so that we have more cross-sections to play with and juxtapose in order to get a better, uh, a better view of what we can discover about the universe. What we're going to look at in this show is how heliophysicists and other astronomers have used this principle to discover uh, principles of the activity on the sun. Since the 1900s, heliophysicists and other astronomers have used what's called the spectrum, which is you take light and you send it through a prism or some type of a, a beam splitter in order to split it up into its rainbow. Now, we, disco we have discovered that uh, the rainbow is not just in visible light, but it also goes into the infrared, which you can't see with your regular eyes. It also goes into deep into the ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray, etc which you can't see with your eyes, but we can pick it up with various instruments. Now, what astronomers do is pick out specific bands of, this, uh, of the spectrum, and they look at how these different bands represent themselves in the sun or other astronomical objects. For example, this spectrum here is a spectrum of uh, hydrogen. This is a spectrum of helium, both of which occur at the surface of the sun. And so when you look at light from the sun and you split that up, you get something that looks more like this, where you have a variety of lines being created by a variety of, of chemicals and elements on the sun. So astronomers look at how they represent themselves on the surface of the sun. Now, this is what you see if you look at the sun through a telescope. With a filter, don't look at it with a regular telescope because you'll go blind like Galileo. So don't be stupid like Galileo. But this is what you see. It's essentially a yellow ball. Sometimes you see uh, dark spots passing across the, across the surface of it. But if we look at this in the ultraviolet, we see a completely different creature. You see the surface looks finely granulated. And these things that we thought were featureless spots are actually crackling with very bright activity. Ultraviolet. Now, if you look at it in the extreme ultraviolet, you see an even more interesting picture. These spots are flinging material out into space. This is a very violent, dynamic creature. It looks completely different. And by the way, this is actually false color. This is uh, colorized. It doesn't really look this color in the ultraviolet. We've made it this color so you can see the features. If you look at the sun in x-rays, you see an even more violent picture. And you can see that the sun is actually flinging material out into space, sometimes at us, like last week when it pumped out so-called X7 flare, 
which is one of the most powerful events that we, that we see happening on the sun. It happens periodically. So what astronomers do is they take these images of the sun, each of which look like a completely different beastie, and combine them in various ways in order to make forecasts. Now, one of the first observations that uh, was made of the sun was a count of the number of sunspots that pass over the surface. All right, it's a very basic, uh, very basic measurement. And what we found is that the sun actually goes through a cycle of these things. Uh, some of the time there's almost no sunspots. But then sometimes the sun actually heats up and you get more and more sunspots. So this is an animation made by NASA uh, of images from the SOHO space satellite starting from about 1996 going through uh, 2008, which was the last so-called solar cycle, where as you can see the sun is getting more and more and more active with sunspots. And if you look closely, you can see that the sunspots actually started relatively high latitude and are migrating towards the equator. Beautiful. Now in 2008, the sun went into its solar minimum. Now we're into the next solar cycle, so-called cycle 24. Now over a long time, people have been counting these sunspots and have recognized that it is a clear cycle. Yes, it starts from the high latitudes and heads down to the equator. High latitude in the south heads towards the equator. But the cycle itself lasts roughly 11 years, give or take. All right, and you can see the actual sunspot count here, about 11 years. This last cycle was about 13 years, about 12 and a half, 13 years. Now, what we recognize with this cycle is that it actually does have a bearing on what happens on the Earth. For example, some have shown that uh, when you have a minimum, very few sunspots, like this area here, you have cold and cloudy weather. When you have a lot of sunspots, it tends to become hot and sunny. In fact, William Herschel, back in the uh, mid-1700s, uh, early 1800s, made the forecast that when you have fewer sunspots, your wheat becomes more expensive. This is the period where you have... Um, where you have cloudier, colder days, so the wheat doesn't grow as well. And he actually made a correlation between price of wheat and number of sunspots. Now, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, keeps a record of the number of sunspots. It's part of their job. And they're measuring the number of sunspots going into this next cycle. And if you look, uh, they're forecasting the peak will be about December 2012, early 2013. But if you look closer, uh, looks like this cycle is actually going to be weaker than the last cycle. In other words, there will be a total less sunspots than the last cycle. Probably less solar flares, a weaker sun. So possibly a uh, colder next few years. Now let's see what this looks like in other senses. All right, we're going to look at uh, several other sense perceptions and how the current 11-year cycle is showing up. First, we're going to look at this line, which is iron 13, uh, or iron 14, which is uh, 530.3 nanometers, and it shows up very well in the outer portions of the sun, the corona. And you see the corona here. All right, and here we've got the sun blocked out. This is from the SOHO LASCO satellite. The sun is blocked out by this disk, and all you can see is this material being flung off the limbs of the sun, all right, the corona. Now, uh, if you look, this, uh, this series of uh, videos of the sun show a specific type of corona which is located mainly around the equator, off the equator. If you look at a different period of the sun, you see that sometimes the corona actually pops out of the poles. This is so-called polar corona. All right, and it tends to coincide with what are called polar crown prominences. This is a video taken by the Japanese Hinoda satellite. And you see the curtain of uh, prominence at the surface of the sun up near the poles, which coincides with this polar type, uh, this polar type corona. Now, what we're going to look at is uh, the observation of this 530.3 nanometer line taken by Dr. Richard Altrock, 
of, uh, at the National Solar Observatory down in New Mexico. And what he looks at is a thin band of the corona at about uh, 1.15 radii of the sun. He uses a ground-based telescope and just looks at this ring around the sun and just gets the intensity of this highly ionized iron. And what he does is he takes, the, he takes the corona, essentially straightens out the two sides of it, and then takes an average to see over time how does that average change. So you watch, he takes the average and then lines it up on a time axis so that what you have here is time going this way and then the vertical is how intense this iron line was at different latitudes of the sun in the corona, and specifically the corona. And what you see is it seems periodic. There's a migration down to the equator, and the migration takes about 11 years. Right? Very nice. It doesn't coincide exactly with the uh, cycle of the sunspots that we see, but it's an 11-year cycle, so we believe that it's uh, correlated very closely. Now what Dr. Altrock is looking specifically at is this feature up at the north, the polar crown prominences, which pop out a little bit before the uh, maximum and then take off towards the poles. Altrock calls this the rush to the poles, and it was actually recognized uh, decades ago, back in the 30s and 40s. <clears throat> now, in the current cycle, he notes something very interesting. Here's a close-up of the northern section. Here you have a rush to the poles, rush to the poles, this is the rush to the poles back in the last solar cycle, so around 2000. And now, the rush to the poles is just barely beginning, and he indicates that it's actually very late in the cycle. So he suggests that the rush is beginning, but it's late, therefore he thinks that maybe the next cycle will actually come on a little bit later than the last one, so that this current solar cycle will probably be uh, a little bit extra long, anomalous, anomalously long. Interesting. Now let's look at another observation with a completely different instrument. Right? This is looking at the uh, 676.8 nanometer line of nickel in the sun. Uh, and these observations were taken by Drs. Frank Hill, Rachel Howe, and their group at the so-called Global Oscillations Network Group called GONG the headquarters of which is located in Tucson, Arizona. And they use a series of uh, six boxes uh, distributed around the planet uh, in order to have a constant, one or two of these boxes are always looking at the sun. So you can have a 24-7 coverage of the sun. Now what they are looking at specifically is not just where the line is, but how the line acts. Because over time, you see something like this. You see how this line is wiggling back and forth? What's happening is that the source of the line, where the nickel is on the sun, is actually vibrating back and forth towards and away the observer, towards and away the telescopes that we have in these uh, boxes that the Gong Group has set up around the planet. And this wiggling back and forth of the surface of the sun causes what's called the Doppler shift in the line. And so we measure that all around the sun. And we get an image something like this. All right, and you can see this, it looks like kind of like a black and white sun, grayscale sun, that's very finely rippled. It looks rough. You see that this part is actually uh, darker than this side. Because what they're uh, measuring here is the dark represents parts of the sun that are moving towards the observer. The light represents parts of the sun that are moving away. So there's a, there's a gray gradient going towards white in this direction. But if you look, the divots are dark and light, which represent the surface of the sun that's just rippling. Here's a still. So you can see it. It's finely rippled. Now what they say is that these ripples of the surface represent millions of sound waves traveling through the interior fluid of the sun. When they take and decompose all of these millions of tones, uh, 
they, they can determine various changes which they believe are occurring very deep within the sun because they think that the, these waves are not merely traveling through the surface, but they're traveling through the deep interior of the sun. In fact, they believe that this is the only real way that we can get an idea of what's happening deep within the sun. Otherwise, all of our other instruments can only see the surface and the corona of the sun and possibly a little bit deeper into these uh, sunspots. But uh, this method, which is called helioseismology, they believe will tell us something deep within the sun. One thing they recognized several years ago is what they called the torsional oscillation, which paints a picture of the sun as an elastic body. Here's an animation they made of it. Now what they found is that bands of the sun rotate faster than other bands of the sun. So it's, it doesn't rotate as a solid body. It, various parts rotate faster and slower. Here the red is faster rotating sun while the green and blue are slower rotating. And if you look closely, there's a band in the north and south which migrates towards the equator. And what they're showing here is that this occurs over an 11 year cycle. You see it now. These two bands starting at mid-latitudes, north and south, and then they migrate to the equator. And they say they've seen this several times, and it accurately, uh, it accurately mirrors the actual uh, solar cycle, the actual sunspot cycle. What they do is they take this and make another plot, kind of like Altrock's plot, where here you have time, and on the vertical you have latitude of the sun. So here's the equator. Here's the North Pole, here's the South Pole. Red means fast rotating. Green and blue means slow rotating. So you can see at any one time, like uh, the year 2000, you can see that the very, very uh, south latitude of the sun is rotating very quickly. And then a mid-latitude of the sun is rotating very quickly. And it's mirrored uh, in the northern hemisphere. Now the black contour represents where we see the sunspots on the sun through the cycle. So you see here was the beginning of the uh, cycle 23. Here was the end of cycle 23. You can see that there was actually a very long solar minimum after 2008 compared to this solar minimum, which is very relatively short before solar cycle 23. Now what you see is that they, uh, they show on this graph that this torsional oscillation begins at the north and south and then begins to migrate towards the equator. One ends in the middle of the progression of another one. Now if you look uh, about 11, 12 years ago, oops, you see something like this. All right, back in 1996-97, uh, the torsional oscillation was at about 20, 25 degrees, and you had the beginning of the torsional oscillation of this, of the current cycle at about the same time in higher latitudes. They can see this with the uh, with this oscillations. Now if you compare this with where we are today, which should be at about the same spot because we're at the same uh, we're at the we're at the same position in the current solar cycle that we were in cycle 23, which you can see with the location of this band. All right, you see something very uh, alarming. The torsional oscillation has not appeared yet for the next cycle. Very strange. Hill and Howe and also Altrock combine their observations and they propose that the next cycle, because of these two observations, the, rush, the uh, very late rush to the poles and the absent torsional oscillation, they propose that the next solar cycle will probably come on very late and possibly be quite weak. Now we're going to look at a third uh, wavelength band. Now this one is going to look directly at the surface of the sun, the so-called photosphere, and it's not anywhere in the visible. It's out here in the infrared. This is the 1,564.8 nanometer line, and it's being observed by Matthew Penn and Bill Livingston at the McMath Pierce Solar Telescope, which is quite an amazing piece of technology. It's a long, it looks like it's the so-called upside-down checkmark telescope, it's a long tube drilled into the ground, which has kept the same temperature as the ambient temperature down in Tucson, Arizona at Kitt Peak. Um, and it's, it's the most powerful solar telescope we have on the ground. Now they're using this in order to look at how this line 
acts, specifically how this iron line, this is uh, neutral iron, how it functions inside of a sunspot. Now, it was discovered early in the uh, 1900s that when you take an element, force it to display its spectrum, and then put it within a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field, each of the uh, spectral lines will split. And the split is proportional to how strong the magnetic field is. This is called the Zeeman split. Now, uh, Penn and Livingston are looking at how the uh, iron line splits inside of uh, the sunspots. And as we can see, the line splits very much within a sunspot, right? This is the spectrum at this part of this image. This is the spectrum within the sunspot, and this is the spectrum below the sunspot along this line. And what we find is that within the sunspots, that's where you have the strongest magnetic field because you have the split. Now, the magnetic field is measured in gauss, and it's usually several thousand gauss uh, within the sunspots. Now, what Penn and Livingston show, they've been looking at this for the past decade and a half or so, and looking at the spectrum in every single sunspot. And what they're finding is that the Zeeman split is getting weaker and weaker on average every year. They indicate that, uh, first of all, no sunspot displays a magnetic field that's weaker than 1,500 Gauss. All right, that's, that's the cutoff here. But then they also show that on average, every year, the average strength of magnetic field within the sunspots is dropping by 50 Gauss. Now, their recent, uh, their recent paper, which was put out last year, indicates that if this drop continues linearly, which we have every indication that it's headed in this direction, by about 2015 to 2020, the sun's magnetic field will be too weak to produce sunspots. Now, what do we get when we combine these three observations, or right, three completely different instruments, three completely different bands of radiation, therefore three completely different senses? When you combine the observations, you get what the American Astronomical Society forecasted back on June 15, 2011. The current sunspot cycle, cycle number 23, may be the last sunspot cycle for several decades. Now, the last time we saw this was a long time ago. <clears throat> if you go back to uh, the entirety of uh, measurements of sunspots over the history of uh, the world, the earliest observations were back in about 1610, 1615 by collaborators of Kepler, Johannes Kepler, the same man who invented the telescope. His collaborators were the first ones to measure numbers of sunspots on the sun. And what you find, if you reconstruct the counts, between about 1645 to 1715, there's almost no sunspots. And this wasn't because people stopped counting sunspots. It's because very few sunspots were actually observed. Now, it begins again at about 1715 and takes off. You have little dips here and there, like the so-called uh, uh, Dalton minimum, et cetera, long-term cycles. In about the 1950s, you have the highest yet. And then we're going into the current cycle. But this period, where there were no sunspots, which is indicated by these three uh, recent observations, this period coincided in Europe with what's called the Little Ice Age, which was one of the coldest periods on record in Europe. This is the time when birds were freezing as they flew through the air and plummeted to the ground. This is the period where you have paintings of the Thames River and other rivers frozen solid. Uh, you have these stories of people setting up little roads and shops and uh, things like that on the Thames in order to kind of have fun with the fact that it was so cold. Until it got so cold that people started dying of the cold and the food started to freeze. All right, that was this period. Now, all indications are that we're headed into another period just like that. This will be the first complete observation of one of these long cycles on the sun. Now let's step back for a moment. The sun has been around for a long time. It's been around for at least as long as life has existed on the earth. By all current estimates, the sun is about five to six billion years old. This sun has been with us through all of the mass extinctions of organisms, such as the extinction of the dinosaurs, 
the extinction back in the, uh, after the Permian, which wiped out 98% of the organisms on the planet. The sun has been with us through this whole time. And if you look at the fact that there's, apparent, there's an apparent cyclicity cycle of uh, mass extinctions on the Earth of about 62 to 65 million years, we should assume that the sun also has much, much longer cycles that perhaps coincide with these extinctions. Now, we don't know what's in the sun or what's creating the cycles that we observe or hypothesize exist. We've only done real observations of the sun for, uh, if you go back, really back to the uh, Greeks and Egyptians, for maybe two, three thousand years. And we've been keeping detailed observations of features on the sun for only about 300 years, three and a half, uh, 350 years. So we don't know what's driving the cycles within the sun, but we can make forecasts based on juxtaposing contradictory sense perceptions and then using our uh, creativity that we are created with in order to make these forecasts. We can then act on these forecasts and change the behavior of the human species accordingly. Doesn't this mean that uh, if we prepare now, we can save the human race from extinctions such as what wiped out the dinosaurs? Doesn't that make us an immortal species? Doesn't that make it possible that we could preserve the existence of the human race and the other species that we take along with us indefinitely? If you look at this another way, if you are the substance which develops those insights which are commensurate with the creative substance of the universe, doesn't that make you exactly what, n what is not sense perceived? Yes, man inhabits a mortal body, but our true substance is the same as that of the universe, and it's there that the true immortality of the creative individual resides. Okay, after all that, let's take some time and actually look at some of the recent weather on Saturn. Now, at about December of uh, last year, we noticed a feature pop up on Saturn called uh, the Northern Storm. It's a huge storm, and we began observing it with various telescopes on the Earth, and also began looking, taking snapshots of it with the Cassini satellite, which is orbiting it. By about February of this year, you can see the storm has actually wrapped all the way around Saturn. This is the tail of the storm coming around from the other side. This is a close-up of the core of the storm. This thing is rippling with activity. We actually have recordings online of a, an almost constant hum of large thunder and lightning occurring uh, in this storm of Saturn, which might remind some people of the electrical storm we had on the mid-Atlantic coast uh, over the past few days. But if you look, the storm, if you unwrap this northern latitude of Saturn, the storm is going all around uh, the planet. If you look at it a couple hours later, you see that the, st that the storm changes rapidly. And mind you, this storm is uh, about the uh, radius of the Earth. All right? It's absolutely gigantic, and it's changing at a very rapid pace. Now, weather is not just occurring on Saturn. Now, this is, this is the first time we've seen a storm of this magnitude. We've seen other storms, but this is the largest that we've seen. Let's look at the moon Titan, which is uh, the largest moon of Saturn, probably the one body on the, uh, in the solar system that's most like Earth. Right now, Titan is beginning to experience storms, as is seen in this uh, very strangely shaped storm cloud. To all uh, knowledge, it's right now raining on Titan. This is the beginning of its rainy season, but it's not raining water. It's raining uh, uh, methane. If you look at another moon of Saturn, Enceladus, the whitest body in the solar system, you see that it's pumping out jets from its south pole. These are the so-called south polar jets. And this image was just taken uh, several days ago. So you're having weather on not just Saturn, but also the moons of Saturn. The whole Saturn system is beginning to explode. Now, we've seen large storms on Saturn before, although this one is the largest one that we've seen. The last several times that we've seen these storms was right after Saturn's summer solstice. Saturn is also inclined to its orbit like the Earth, so it experiences seasons just like the Earth, although the seasons take about 30 years to complete. So it's about between seven to nine years between seasons. So the last time we saw storms like this was after 
the uh, summer solstices. Uh, but this storm is happening way too early right now. We just passed the spring, uh, the spring equinox, the vernal equinox on Saturn. The summer solstice isn't really supposed to happen until 2017. So right now, we really don't know what's causing the weather on, in the Saturn system. Nobody knows what's causing the weather on the Saturn system. Maybe the sun has something to say about this? This has been your weather report. Thanks for joining me today.